and took it. And <laughs> I got three calls. So I may I'll introduce and then I'll have Anita sit down. So please come over and meet, meet the committee. Anita McDowell, this is our chair. Hi, Linda Dunleavy. Matt, how are you? Roby Grant, Anita Hi. McDowell. My pleasure. Hi, how are you? Hello, committee. You can walk around this way even if you would like, and this is a qualified you can watch your step right here, and actually, you can sit right here. So this will work. In front of the microphone. Okay. Sorry to keep you waiting a little bit. So we um, read the very long question in advance before, so we're not going to read it again. But you received it. And talk to us. All right. It is a joy to be here this evening. Thank you. I come from Plainfield School District, a very similar district in many ways to this district. I've been serving there as the Director of Special Services for the past two years um, in a point six role. And I am excited to uh, share my uh, reflections on service delivery and programming for special needs children pre-K through 22. Um, I really believe that the most important and essential components are unity in the adults uh, because it is a team decision when uh, children are, uh, their lives are kind of put on the table before all of us and we have to be very thoughtful and know the child. Um, I, I firmly, um, I'm, I'm very grounded in uh, kind of a conceptual framework based on the work of Nell Nottings. Um, in 1992, she wrote a book about caring in schools that is a seminal work. I'm also very influenced by Russ Quaglia's work on student voice. I'm also very influenced by Dr. Robert Brooks and his work on uh, encouraging children and believing in children. Um, so those are kind of the foundational underpinnings of my phil philosophical um, uh, uh, foundation. Be, be uh, undergirding what I am presenting to you. Uh, so in, essentially uh, all students needs have to be individualized uh, as we all know and it's, it's critical that the adults care about the child and get to know what exactly works for that child. Uh, I think that that has to be authentic and I think it has to be um, uh, informed by a lot of voices. Uh, at the table and uh, I think um, I want almost want to skip ahead to the very final part of the um, questioning to the communication piece because I feel that that is so um, vitally important to this work um, if, if um, there's uh, dissension if there's um, differences of views and um, people don't take the time to, to find common ground um, that can really end up hurting the children. Um, so I, I feel very um, committed to bridge building. Um, so I'll say that kind of in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you asked about the question of um, transition ages for the students. And so, yeah, I actually think there are quite a few of them. Um, the, of course, the entry into school is a huge transition for a child, leaving their home, um, le leaving their family. They're familiar to us. <laughs> um, so that's a huge transition. Uh, if you have full day kindergarten, I do not know if you do or not. Mm -hmm. We just started. Yeah, All right, you do. So that is um, another enormous transition mm -hmm. for the child. Um, I think that when a child goes in some, depending on your, how your programming is um, in your pre-K through six, I, I think and uh, leaving grade four and going into grade five can be a big step if there's uh, changes in terms of how uh, the day is structured. Um, so that, that I would say is a, another transition time. Um, and of course the switch from six to seven. And then I think it, between nine and 10, there's a big switch then as well. And then finally at senior year on to post-secondary. Uh, so there are so many. Uh, we are really responsible for the portion in the high school going forward there. But so many already have taken place. So we have to care about the child all the way through. We have to do a really good job about matching children to um, 
primary teachers um, and groupings have to be very thoughtful because a child will not necessarily thrive in every group that they're put in. So all of that has to be thought about. Um, let's see, so the next um, question had to do with, let's see, um, I might be skipping one, um, grants and budget. I think I did skip one. Uh, I'll do grants and budget just because I thought of it. Uh, I have a tremendous uh, background in grant writing, so I have been involved um, outside of education a little bit in grant writing. Um, I, at a very young age, while I was still in uh, my bachelor's degree years and years ago, I did a $40,000 grant for the Berkshire Ballet Company, um, which was successful. Um, I also wrote um, and um, worked on a grant with um, some students around community service learning. So the students ended up um, putting on their own conference about stress relievers. Um, which was really exciting for them. And that was in a charter school environment as a special educator and an advisor. Um, I have helped with the management of a two and a half million dollar grant for Forest Legacy um, funds to a local land conservation agency. Um, and I just did that over one summer. Um, I have, of course, written IDA grants for the last two years and know all of the components to doing so. Um, and you have to put in activities that are related to the students' uh, needs. And they have to be used and they have to be um, tracked and inventoried and documented. So I'm, un I'm very familiar with all of that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say in terms of budget writing and special education, I have done two uh, budgets now, two rounds of budgets, um, approximately 1.2 million each of those. Uh, represents um, the first represented a 16 and a half percent savings to our district approximately and so that was um, well received and it was successful um, and so then the second year was an implementation year of a, of a new model uh, we have um, in our district we have a declining enrollment and so there are 44 identified students in the district K through pre-k through um, age 22, and, the, and I pretty much this, that doubles in this district from mm -hmm. what I've looked at um, on your website. Um, so I feel ready for that. I feel uh, competent. I feel like I have a lot to bring to the role, and I would like to join you. Um, let's see. Uh, transition, budget. I'm going to cheat and look at my little note card. Oh, that's awesome. Ah, yeah, PD. So I. Um, I have done quite a bit on training uh, the staff, especially the paraprofessionals. I think paraprofessionals are really important. Um, it, it, their um, support is, is vital. I also th think that you can go off track with, para with use of paraprofessionals. You can um, over support. So I'm very um, aware of that risk, I'll call it, as well. Uh, the kinds of training that I have been involved with just this year are book study. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Rostin's and Saldana's book, um, which is uh, Make Just One Change. And it's um, sponsored by the Right Question Institute, it's, um, published by Harvard Education. And it is a fa fantastic uh, study of how to get students to generate their own questions. And um, it's creates great engagement in, in a learning environment. Um, so I would highly recommend that as a, as a PD here. Um, I also have a great deal of training in different reading methodologies. And so um, in special education, many children have reading needs. Um, so I'm very familiar with Orton Gillingham, Wilson, Linda Mood Bell. And I'm trained in all, all, all but Wilson myself. Um, I, I'm also trained in something called rewards, which is a multi-sensory remedial teaching approach that is, um, I'm going to call it fast and effective. You can do it in just a few months in groups, um, and it basically helps children attack those multi-syllabic words and get the rules down so that they can just move. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I, I really believe in that, and I know I could offer training in that. Um, other types of trainings, um, 
I would say I have an interest in behavioral, um, emotional disabilities, which I had shared in my um, talk with some of the members of this community already. Um, so anything along the lines of trauma-informed care, positive behavioral supports, I, I would be very interested in being involved in trainings like that. Um, let's see. All right, and then I'm going to just end with the communication piece. Um, so you've given me 10 minutes. I hope I'm using it wisely. Um, I really think that uh, there are a number of, you sort of have to know when to use certain different, certain types of communication. Um, there's a time for face-to-face, -face, there's a time for tel telephone contact, there's a time for uh, an email, um, there's a time for a hug. I mean, you have to know what to do. Um, and I, I'd like to think that I've learned a lot in, the, in my first two years as a director in terms of when and what to choose. So, if you have questions for me, I would love to respond. Thank you. I have, I have You're a very question well. for you. Um, could you describe the changes in special education administration in our new arrangement and the role of the special education administrator in interacting with the SPED coordinator, teachers, and parents? The first half of your question I didn't quite get. Uh, could you describe the changes that we're proposing in our special education department? So I have been trying to get into your website so that I could find <laughs> minutes, and I'm not in there. Okay. So I'm going to need a little coaching in terms of what those changes are so that I can speak to them. Uh, well, we're moving from having a special education administrator and some special education teachers to having a coordinator in Building between coordinator? those two. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, helpful if I say what the coordinator does. Would that be sure, sure. I know. To, yeah, I, I'm aware. So that's fine. Um, Okay, so in the past you've had a director and you've had no building coordinator. So that should help you. Yes, <laughs> we're hoping so. Uh, it will share the work, it will share all the LEA rep uh, responsibilities. Um, you have 88 children, that's a lot of meetings. Um, it will allow your director to attend to maybe, if you have a, out of districts, it will allow your director to keep some of that on the plate a little easier. Um, I can't see anything wrong with it. I, I think that's an excellent change. And, I, I'm, um, and the second half of your question had to do with? Well, so how would, what the role of the special education administrator would be in the new model in oh. terms of interacting with teachers and parents and the coordinator? Well, uh, a little bit backstepped, obviously, because you want your billing coordinator out there. You want your billing coordinator to know all your case managers and all your paras. Um, so not quite as, you know, close to the road, so to speak, but I think it's still, still important that the person be visible and be, um, responsive. Um, I, I, I see you setting up a little bit of a chain of command in doing this that is important to have so that if you had any kind of conflicts, it could be managed differently now. Um, and then I think it just gives that nice wide lens for the person stepping into this role so that they can really spend some nice creative energy on the big picture. Yeah. Thank you. Would you spend some time um, telling the school committee your background and what, you, what you've done over your career? Um, I'll work backwards. Um, so before taking this initial role as a director. I have a great deal of background as an educator. I've been teaching since, well, 1987. Um, so I have many years of teaching experience. I started as an English teacher in a technical high school in Franklin County, uh, Franklin County Tech. Um, my career evolved to special education. Um, I am passionate about special education. I have a, a, a dyslexic adult son who's now a police officer down at Greenfield. Sorry, Mike. Uh, <laughs> and I have um, a, just a passion for the work. Now that I, I especially um, have a heart for children's uh, self, sense of self-efficacy, I think it's really important 
to keep that on the, on the screen at all times, no matter what the disability. Because if we're harming that, or if we're not um, building that up, we're really not doing our job. So um, I've worked in a charter school environment uh, for five years. I've served on a board as an elected teacher representative for two years. I've um, had a great deal of board experience the past two years um, because of the, being in a role of an, as an administrator. Uh, I have excellent writing skills, which I contribute to this community, and a huge heart. So I don't know if that's enough. But <laughs> and um, I, I don't know the answer to this, so may, and I don't know if you will, but uh, the difference between Massachusetts and New Hampshire, the regulations, there rules, requirements, and w w what can you tell us? You apprenticed, interned. Which I term guess. do you want with Greenfield? It, it is actually in, um, officially an apprenticeship uh, through the Depar Massachusetts Department of Education in order to get, obtain my licensure uh, in special ed administration. And that required me to do a 500 hour intensive internship under a licensed professional that also held a special ed uh, credential in Massachusetts. Dr. Hollins uh, was my mentor and uh, a dear friend and she had been in her final um, months of her own um, superintendency. Uh, so she held two licensures and she actually now serves on the Board of Trustees in uh, the Board of Directors in Greenfield. Um, so I worked with a phenomenal mentor um, that I'm forever grateful to her. Um, May I ask a specific yes. uh, question to that? <clears throat> is um, I, I, I'm just curious, and I don't know, is New Hampshire a categorical state for eligibility like Massachusetts? So uh, do yes, students it is. have to, it is a categorical yeah, state. Yeah, and you have okay. to use eligibility criteria per the disability, okay. and it's you go by those checklists for okay. eligibility purposes. Okay. Absolutely. So it, there's actually more similarities than differences. And tell us a bit about the school you're at now. Mm -hmm. A very t small um, rural uh, school, ta uh, Blue Ribbon School in New Hampshire. Um, What's that? I don't know what that is. So a Blue Ribbon School in New Hampshire is a high-performing school, a school um, that um, is uh, lauded uh, for its um, rigor and creativity and innovation. Uh, so Plainfield is a school that meets is described that way. Um, it kind of sits in the shadow of Dartmouth-Hitchcock and Hanover and all of those um, kinds of places up there. Uh, it's lovely. Um, and it's also an agrarian community, much like this community. So that's exciting to me. Um, people are very proud of that. Um, and I understand that's true here as well. Um, there are uh, going to be about 196 students when we reopen the school in September. And so that's down. Um, I think we're around 210 right now, um, and it is a continual declining um, trend at the elementary level. So that's uh, from pre-K through 8, and then we have students that um, we have an area agreement to our local high school in the neighboring town of Lebanon, and those students are tuitioned in to Lebanon for 9 through 12. Of that, 44 students are identified currently. And then um, we have, oh, it just went to 45, sorry. Um, the meeting was, um, so it's, it's, it's about double here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? So I needed to say here you're getting your PhD? I am, EDD, EDD, mm -hmm. yes. In educational leadership. I am, yes. <coughs> Southern New Hampshire University. So I just um, am completing my first year, and it's a program designed for working um, educational leaders, and uh, everyone is a full-time person in the field, and we are responsible for coursework, and of course a dissertation by the end of three or four years, you can go into fourth year if you need to. Um, we meet once a month on a Saturday, and everything else is online. It's very uh, friendly to leaders working. What excites oh. you most about this job? 
the uh, similarities to what I've been doing, so it almost feels like I'm moving right into um, the, the, the next step, the logical next step for, for the work I've been doing. So, um, and I, I want to grow in terms of the amount of time that I'm um, permitted to be in this role. Um, where I've been, I have worn the hat of an ESOL teacher one day a week. So I've taught all the ESOL kids, and that will actually be a little heartbreaking for me to say goodbye to those kids because um, I've been their teacher. Um, but it'll be nice to be able to actually wear the administrator's hat full time, you know, all of the time that I'm at work instead of two different roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's English for speakers of other languages. Yes. People, sometimes the acronyms are different. So. What do you think would be the hardest part about taking this job for you? Oh. Well, I think initially I'm a, a little bit shy, and so it will be hard for me to get to know you just because I'm a, by nature I'm a little bit shy. Um, I've I've grown so much you probably wouldn't have picked up on that, but um, inside that's what's going on. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you see yourself doing in five to seven years? Uh, more leadership, and actually, I would like to um, write. I would like to write books um, eventually. Mm -hmm. Romance novels? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was There's a school committee <laughs> subcommittee for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on. Linda will assign you. Anything else? Anything for us? Oh, I have. A few, yes, yes. Please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wonder if there are current initiatives besides the initiative to change um, and put, add that la layer into the structure of this department, just school wide or even related to this department. Are there initiatives that I should be aware of coming in? PBIS? Did you guys talk about that? Did we talk about PBIS? We did not. We did not talk about it. Go. I'm happy to. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Just let me do it. So thank you, Anita. I would say some of the major initiatives underway, one is the implementation of positive behavioral interventions and supports. We're using primarily the University of Massachusetts at Amherst as our partner in that work, although the work comes out of UConn. And so it's the work that you'd be familiar with yes. nationwide. That we implemented at the elementary school last year was year one of implementation. We're into year two. Um, we're looking to continually improve the quality of the data so that the data that we're getting back from teachers is um, similar when teachers yeah. are reporting on the kinds of things, reliable, thank you, on the kinds of things that they're observing in the classroom. Uh, we've seen some tremendous gains as a result of that, so we definitely want that to continue. Last year, we stuck a toe in the water where it came to academic response to intervention and tier instructions, particularly for early literacy. And we formally started doing tiered instructional groupings in K, 1, 2, and 3 this year. We're looking to expand to grade 4 next year. The upper elementary has been looking um, very closely at how to increasingly implement technological tools. We're a Google school. So several of our teachers are experimenting with and using Google Classroom. We have Read and Write for Google, which has been a godsend for students who really struggle with auditory processing issues, dyslexia, and other things that expressive language. And I don't know as an aside, if you all have noticed that even in your Google Docs now, it'll give you the option, do you want to type or talk? Mm -hmm. It'll pick it up right away. Mm -hmm. So we're using many of Google tools, mm -hmm. particularly with expressive written language and expressive language. We have implemented some assistive technology at the high school. Um, we have a couple of students uh, at the high school that benefit greatly from assistance with communication using assistive technology, uh, iPads. We're working on helping them to program their own speech responses. That's a work in progress right now. So PBIS, Response to Intervention, or RTI at the elementary level, and the integration of technology, particularly as it pertains to increasing academic achievement and expressive written language, and uh, the ability to access text at grade level when reading poses too significant of an impediment for that. At the middle high school, our 7 through 12 campus here, from a social-emotional perspective, Mr. Beck has done a great deal of work around starting a restorative justice model He's worked very hard and has 
uh, decreased at what one might consider in the past perhaps an over-reliance on out-of-school exclusions. Those have fallen significantly. So socialist justice, restorative justice, he's trained several students as active bystanders and is really focusing on improving student leadership and student engagement and agency. We have a um, great collaboration between regular and special education at the high school. So it's teacher created and teacher driven. So we have a teacher who's taken on teaching reading at the high school level. We've seen students, some of them on individual education plans, some of them on 504 plans, some of them not on any of those, just reading below grade level. Mm -hmm. In some cases, we've observed jumps as much as, and, or greater than sometimes, two grade levels. Um, in short order, we're seeing incredible gains there. Um, so those are probably the biggest academic and social emotional initiatives that we would be looking to continue and strengthen and deepen over time. And I'm sorry, I'm so fighting a major cough right now that I'm hoping the camera pans back to you for a question so I can just cough over here. Thank you. I have two for a nice question. camera work. Thank you. I was about to Thank you. Um, I would like to know uh, the collaboration groupings that happen amongst adults across the two schools or within the schools. And I would also like to know if there's any um, lens being uh, aimed at personalized learning and mm -hmm. competency-based education. Mm -hmm. uh, collaboration <laughs> groups. We, um, how would you define a collaboration group? We have a lot of committed, active, creative, devoted parents and parent groups. Um, we have a really active parent-teacher organization, mostly active at the elementary school level. We have um, a group called the Hadley Mothers Club that's been in existence, I think, since 1934, 40-something, that um, does a lot of fundraising work and uh, charitable projects for the school. We have Helping Hearts for Hadley Schools, which sponsors a 5K run every year, and the proceeds of that are given to both um, elementary school and Hopkins. We have a 351-year-old Hopkins Academy trustees group. We have one of the oldest high schools in the country. Um, and the trustees manage a trust established in 16 something something, something. 351 years ago, right? Um, and did I? And we have a boosters club. We have boosters, athletic boosters, music boosters. We have a revitalized and engaged CPAC committee that has helped and is work, has worked a lot with the school committee in the past year. We have just implemented a community-wide and school-wide survey, um, making sure that we are, we the school committee, are prioritizing our work effectively. How'd I do? That's pretty Great. good. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> We are awesome, really, as a town, <laughs> as a community, as a school. What was the other question? She had another so, question that we have to have an answer. Positive behavioral um, I'm sorry. Um, competency personalized based learning and competency-based competency -based education. education. Yes. So, given our size, one of the one of the as uh, Ms. Dunleavy often says, one of the, our greatest assets is our size, and sometimes it's the greatest challenge. So, personalized learning does happen. I would argue authentically and naturally mm -hmm. here. Adults know every child in every building. There just isn't a child. And really, I would say almost all children, if not all children, are known by all adults in both buildings. We have increasingly used technology to drive more personalized learning experiences, whether that's in small instructional groups, response to intervention, certainly as we start transition planning at the high school, and what I described to you in, in using technology for communication, um, for navigation, for scheduling, those are all very much competency-based um, uh, outcomes for students. In terms of 
competency-based education in a more traditional sense, which really is technical kinds of education sometimes, our students very often will attend Smith Vocational if they choose, similar to Franklin County, so if they choose a career and technical pathway or they want Chapter 74 approved education, mm -hmm. then they um, go to Smith Folk. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are we good? So. All right. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Thanks for Pleasure. coming in. Thanks for staying a little longer than. Yeah, not much longer. Not too bad. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.